This is Financial Standard, the definitive source of news, thought leadership and analysis for Australian wealth management professionals. Financial Standard. Take the lead. Hello and welcome to the Financial Standard podcast. I'm Jamie Williamson, Managing Editor of Financial Standard. Recently, the government launched its consultation on the use of genetic testing results in life insurance underwriting, aimed at addressing emerging concerns that the industry-led partial moratorium, which was introduced in 2019, continues to discourage consumers from participating in both established clinical genetic testing, which could identify a need for potentially life-saving treatment, and also medical research involving genetic testing. Today, I'm joined by Jessica Chen, a member of the Actuaries Institute, to talk through the issues that have led to the government questioning whether greater regulation is required. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for jumping on the pod with us today. As mentioned, the consultation has now launched and it's been largely informed by the 2023 Australian Genetics and Life Insurance Moratorium Monitoring the Effectiveness and Response, also known as the A Glimmer Report. The Actuaries Institute has long reported on the issues with genetic testing and life insurance as well. In fact, in 2017, a report that you yourself authored said that what was needed was a good response to the threat that results may be used and lead to discrimination. Was the moratorium a good response or do you think government regulation is needed? That's a very good question. Before I delve into it, is it okay if I give a bit of background on what the moratorium is and how it generally works? Absolutely. Thank you. (laughs) So look, in general, a moratorium is typically a ban on something. In this case, a genetic moratorium in life insurance is a ban on the use of genetic information when determining life insurance cover. For this ban, it's for cover up to a certain limit. For example, uh, it's for cover up to half a million dollars for death and total and disability insurance. And this ban does not apply to insurance above above that limit. So then back to your question um, in relation to, is it a good response? Do we think legislation is needed? Look, overall, I thought the moratorium was a balanced approach. Uh, The moratorium initially was put in place as there were concerns of anti-discrimination, whereby consumers who wanted life insurance but had an unfavorable genetic result, felt that they would either be charged a higher premium or be declined insurance. And so then when this moratorium came into place, it gave consumers a level of protection whereby they could take out life insurance without the need to provide any genetic information. The moratorium also had a clause for it to be reviewed. So it also allowed the wider public, um, the industry, and the customers, an opportunity to assess its effectiveness. Um, And so then to your question on, is legislation required? Now, that's effectively the question that the Treasury consultation is trying to address, where it intends to review the framework to which genetic information should be used in life insurance. Um, And as you mentioned, the Actuaries Institute has been active on this topic and it tends to participate in the consultation and would look to form its view as part of its submission to Treasury. There's obviously concerns that using test results, as you mentioned, could price people out of life insurance with, you know, adverse test results pushing their premiums up. Is there evidence that this is the case? Like has has the Actuaries Institute actually found any evidence to suggest that I suppose people are not pursuing life insurance because of what the genetic test might reveal? I'm not aware um, of there being evidence. Um, and, And the reason is because the number of people taking out genetic tests at the moment is still quite low. Mm-hmm. And also the moratorium is in place. So it actually prohibits the life insurers to use genetic information and to even gather genetic information um, when pricing. And so therefore, I don't actually believe that um, premiums are increasing as a result of adverse genetic results. Then I guess one other factor could also be that, you know, if somebody was to have genetic testing done and they found that they weren't at any risk of, you know, suffering any hereditary diseases, they might be more likely to withdraw from life insurance. Mm. Is there... I know that you mentioned in your 2017 report that that could be a possibility. Has that at all 
been kind of coming through in any sort of uh, data? Yeah. So look, again, at the moment, I'm not aware of um, any data that says that uh, as a result of a genetic test, people will change their perceived need for insurance. Mm-hmm. But but that that's mostly because, again, the number of people that's taking our genetic test currently still remains low. I mean, of course, there's obviously some reasons why insurers would want genetic test results to be able to be used in underwriting policies. Mm -hmm. Uh, For instance, Mm anti-selection being where those with an increased risk of disease can still obtain cover at, you know, the standard rate. And I guess the concern from them might be that this would kickstart some kind of cycle in which premiums would need to increase across the whole pool Mm -hmm. of insured lives. Um, But then the reverse would be that those who have that clean bill of health from genetic tests might drop out of that pool. And then therefore the pool that's left is, you know, the sort of unhealthier, potentially deteriorating lives, which then forces those premiums higher again. Is there a way that that could be addressed, do you think? Yeah, look, um, it's a good question. So So effectively, for there to be anti-selection, there needs to be a lot of people that take out these tests and also they need to act upon the results. Um, Now, as discussed earlier, right now, there's not a lot of people taking out these tests because actually these tests at the moment are primarily used for family planning purposes. Yeah. And so therefore there's limited anti-selection. However, there is a new generation of genetic tests whereby someone's whole genome will be sequenced and an individual would then be able to understand their prevalence for disease in the future. Yeah. Now, once these tests become available and widely used, then there could be significant anti-selection. And so then to your question on, you know, should, should that happen? How can it be addressed? In thinking about this, Look, disease and the human body is quite complex. And once health outcome is a combination of both their genes and their lifestyle. So as an example for heart disease, um, there's a 50-50 weighting between genetics and lifestyle. So that means that if someone has a high genetic disposition, but then a very healthy lifestyle, their lifestyle actually counterbalances their genetic risk. And so actually my, my view on countering anti-selection is that insurers should actually work with their customers to engage and promote a better lifestyle to mitigate health risks. And if done successfully, we can avoid or minimize the cycle of price rises as a result of anti-selection. Now, of course, there will be people who are unwilling or unable to change their lifestyles. Now, for for those people, the insurance industry and the community need to come together to to see how we can best address this issue. Are those ideas kind of formulated in any way on the back of, uh, you know, observations in in the way that other countries use genetic testing results? Like how, how does Australia's use of those results compare to our global counterparts? Yeah, so globally, there's a wide range of policy on the use of genetic testing in life insurance. And it ranges from the US whereby there's actually no restriction at all. And oh, wow. life insurers yeah. can use the information any which way they, they would like to other countries where there's actually um, a ban on the use of all personal health information, genetics and family history and medical history included. Yeah, And so then for Australia where where you know it's a, it's a combination where we can use family and medical history, but then there is a ban um, or a moratorium on genetic information. I'd say that we are somewhat similar or on par with most of our European counterparties and our Canadian peers. And so, so yeah, so I, I think that we are actually on par with with global standards. Just finally, I just wanted to to ask. I know you mentioned that the Actuaries Institute is planning to to formulate a submission for this consultation, but are you able to speak at all about um, even just personally, like what you hope to see achieved by the consultation and, and any subsequent legislation? On a personal view, I do hope that this consultation will invite a broad range of views to be shared and expressed, 
including views from consumers, academics, insurance experts, and also medical professionals uh, or anyone else who's interested to pro- provide their view. And I hope that as a country, whatever decision we make, it's from a basis of being informed. Um, and mostly I hope that the, the decision is not made from a place of fear, um, a fear of discrimination, a fear of not having genetic data to use, um, but rather from a place of hope, uh, hope that this technology can and will improve the health and quality of our lives and hope that this will then align the interests of the consumers, the medical and the insurance industries. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Jessica, for joining us again today. You've given a lot of food for thought on this particular topic, which I'm sure uh, probably a lot of people don't really think about, but is actually quite an important one for our industry. So thank you again for, for coming on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to this Financial Standard podcast. For more information, visit financialstandard.com.au. Please keep in mind that the information discussed in this podcast is general in nature and does not consider personal circumstances. Reliance should not be placed on any content without further independent financial research and advice. 